Hey everyone, we have a relatively short one today, the final one on tensor and vector algebra. It's on the principal invariance of a tensor and the Cayley-Hamilton equations. This is chapter 2, section 16 in the textbook. So first thing we're going to do is get to the characteristic equation for a tensor. Okay, so if omega is an eigenvalue of a tensor S with a corresponding eigenvector E, then we have this. Well, then we know that S minus omega times the identity <clears throat> acting on E has to equal vector 0 since S times E is equal to omega times E. And, um, you know, E is an eigenvector, and we've said, you know, we're picking E is not equal to vector 0. Well, this means that S minus omega times the identity is a singular tensor, since it maps a non-zero vector to 0. So if it's singular, then its determinant has to be 0. <clears throat> and that gives us the characteristic equation for S. It is an nth order polynomial in omega. Where n is equal to the dimension of v. Which is equal to 3 here. If we express the components <clears throat> of S with respect to an orthonormal basis, then we have the familiar matrix form and matrix determinant. <clears throat> 
which is the determinant of, you know, the matrix. <coughs> so that yields the characteristic equation for S. And here that'll be a third degree polynomial. In the case that um, the dimension of V is three, then the characteristic equation reduces to this. we get omega cubed minus I1 of S times omega squared plus I2 of S times omega <coughs> minus I three of s equals zero. <clears throat> so here i1 of s, i2 of s, and i3 of s are called the principal invariance of s. a principle in the sense that they are the coefficients of the <clears throat> characteristic polynomial and invariant in the sense that if you were to apply say a change of reference frame so you have the same thing going on but you're looking at it from a different angle so in other words you have a rotation <clears throat> um, you would end up with the same principal invariance, and they are given by this. And remember, this is only for the dimension of E equals 3. I1 of S is equal to the trace of S. Now, in general, if the dimension of V was higher, you would have similar expressions, but like if it had dimension 4, there would be four principal invariants that would involve similar things. I2 of S is equal to one half the square of the trace of S minus the trace of S squared <coughs> and I3 of S is equal to the determinant. <clears throat> now these here, um, you can get to these if you were to calculate <clears throat> the characteristic polynomial, right? We know how to take a determinant using epsilon, i, j, k, p, q, r, all that stuff. And, and so you could get the characteristic equation and arrive at all of these. Um, <coughs> we're just not going to bother here because it's a particularly lengthy algebraic manipulation, and it's not really all that illuminating. Um, you know, you just are grouping terms and grouping terms and grouping terms until you end up with these three. <coughs> So, you know, if you want to um, 
practice your index notation stuff and <coughs> see whether you really have good uh, keeping track of stuff chops, then by all means go through and you know what the answer is going to be. So see if you can get there if you want. But, uh, you know, it'll be multiple pages. <coughs> All right, so if S is symmetric, then we can express all three of these in terms of the eigenvalues of S. So we have I1 of S is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. <clears throat> I2 of S is equal to a little bit of a weird product of two of them summed. And then I3 is the product of all of those. Not plus. So one cool thing <coughs> that is always useful to go back and look at um, when you're doing your physics and math and everything, is that all of the terms in this have to have the same dimension, right? So, um, so if a tensor has dimension of, say, length, we'll just use that as an example, then its eigenvalues have to have dimension of length. Um, so this whole thing has dimension of length cubed, right? So omega squared, that has length squared, well, principal invariant one, <clears throat> the trace has dimension of length. Trace squared would have dimension of length squared, and the determinant has dimension of length cubed. And so when you, you know, multiply them all through, it works out. Um, and that's something that you should always do when you're <clears throat> doing your physics and math and everything, is making sure that all of the terms that you're adding together are dimensionally consistent. Because if they're not, then you can be pretty darn sure you've done something wrong. So the principal invariants are invariant in the sense that they are invariant under the group of orthogonal tensors in this way. in the sense that the kth invariant of Q S Q transpose. <coughs> so you can think of that as like a change of coordinates if you're thinking of it as a, a passive transformation, like an observer transformation, is equal to the kth invariant of S this is for all S in 
u in v for all q, and we'll call it orth v, which is to say that the q is an orthogonal one, that its inverse is equal to its transpose. So this sort of invariance is related to Galilean invariance, which basically says that the law, laws of physics should not depend on the uh, inertial frame in which the observer is watching the process happen. You know, everything just has to be translated and rotated back in terms of whatever the observer's coordinate or frame is. <clears throat> Actually, it's not even which inertia, it's just which reference frame the observer is in. All right, so there's a central result of graduate level linear algebra called the Cayley Hamilton theorem. And that is that every tensor S <coughs> satisfies its own characteristic equation. So if the dimension of V is 3, then um, S cubed minus <clears throat> I1 of S, S squared plus I2 of S times S minus I3 of s times the identity is equal to the zero tensor. <coughs> this is a central result in graduate level algebra class, and they do all sorts of stuff with it. Um, and it holds for any tensor, not just <coughs> a symmetric one. Uh, the general proof is a lot more complicated, and so we're not going to bother with it here. Um, the textbook provides a pretty nice, short, simple proof for the case where S is symmetric. Um, <clears throat> I don't really have anything to add to that proof, so if you want to see it, just <clears throat> look in the textbook. <clears throat> it's short enough. But um, now let's do exercise two from section 216.
All right, so we want to show that for any tensor S, the first part, uh, the trace of S squared <coughs> is equal to the square of the first invariant of S minus twice the second invariant of s. All right, well, as a reminder, <coughs> the second invariant of s is equal to 1 half trace squared of s minus trace of s squared, and i1 of s is just the trace of s. So this one's going to be pretty easy, I think. So if we write out i1 squared of s <coughs> minus 2 i2 of s, that gives us the trace squared, and then minus the half is going to go away, trace squared of s, and plus the trace of s squared. Okay, so the trace of s squared is equal to i1 squared minus 2i2. Well, that's what we were trying to prove. So that was pretty easy. And let's go on to the second half of that. <clears throat> Show that the trace of s cubed is equal to this. Nah. We'll put that. Is equal to this expression. The cube of the first invariant minus 3 i1 <clears throat> plus 3i3 three three of s. All right, and so this one is restricted to the dimension of v equaling 3. All right, well, the Cayley-Hamilton theorem tells us that S has to satisfy its own characteristic equation, so we have that S cubed <coughs> minus I1 of S, S squared plus I2 of S s minus i3 of s identity is equal to tensor 0. <coughs> All right, so s cubed is equal to i1 s squared minus i2 s plus i3 identity. <coughs> Let's take the trace of both sides. You'll recall that the trace is linear in all of its arguments, so <coughs> this is equal to the trace <coughs> 
All right, well, since the trace is linear, we can split that up and move all of the principal invariants to the outside of trace. <coughs> since trace of, you know, a scalar times a tensor is that scalar times the trace of the tensor. So this is equal to I1 of S trace S squared minus I2 of S trace S. And then the trace of the identity tensor is 3 when the dimension of V is 3. So we'll call this plus 3 I3 of S. <coughs> <clears throat> All right, we're going to add and subtract the trace of s times the trace of s squared. So this is equal to, right, so i1, or rather we're not, um, because i1 of s is the trace of s times the trace of s squared. And then minus, let's write out what I2 is. And then plus 3. <clears throat> All right, so now we're going to do, I was getting ahead of myself there. We're going to, um, you see that we have a minus one half trace of S cubed. So what we're gonna do is add trace of S, the trace cubed of S here, and then subtract three halves of it over here. All right, so that is equal to trace cubed of s minus three halves <coughs> trace cubed of s plus three halves trace s trace of s squared and then plus 3 i3 all right well now here on these terms we can factor out one trace of s right and then you get three times the second principal invariant times the trace, which is the first. So let's do that is equal to All right, so that is equal to the first invariant cubed minus 3 times the first invariant times the second invariant. <clears throat> 
plus 3 times the third invariant. Which if we look back up, is what we were trying to prove. So that's good. That one was a little bit <coughs> more work than the first half of the problem, but not too terrible. All right, that wraps it up for our talk on tensor and vector algebra. We're going to move on to differentiation and integration. Fly through that pretty quick and be on to kinematics before you know it. Uh, catch you later. Have a good one.